Um, we were examining uh, the concept of Fourier, ser Fourier analysis, and uh, you know, a Fourier transform is something that you apply to a time series or, or a spatial series. But a Fourier transform from time to frequency um, takes a, a time series and yields a, a another series in what in frequency. And we're going to we're going to talk about Fourier transforms that that yield um, Fourier components that are um, evenly spaced in frequency. Um, I'll, I'll try to tell you when we actually get to uh, defining that. So what you're going to see is, um, uh, and you see that what I guess it's on the the bottom of um, of the uh, the FFT lab window. You see the Fourier transform components as a series, with the horizontal axis being frequency. So it's a, it's not a time series; it's a frequency series. Uh, and then on the top, you see the time series. Okay, and and on each on each bottom and top, you see the real and the imaginary parts. Um, so uh, um, if you are able to generate these Fourier components at different frequencies, okay. And I'll use omega, the rotational frequency, equal to two pi f. I'll use that for um, uh, for frequency. Then uh, your original time series, you can compose according to Fourier theory uh, with this summation. Okay, and this summation is uh, basically taking each um, each Fourier component, which is a complex number, and scaling that and using using that Fourier component. To scale this imaginary exponential, okay, this Euler exponential, which you know now is e, this this e to the minus i omega sub j uh, times t is actually equal to um, uh, cosine uh, uh, omega sub j times t minus i sine omega sub j times t. Okay, so there's uh, uh, this is a shorthand notation essentially, but you know, when you see that imaginary exponential, you know now that uh, there are sines and cosines involved here, and it's and it's complex. And of course, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> f uh, sub j is a complex number, and this uh, uh, Euler exponential is a complex number. So uh, you know, you multiply the two together, and you add them together, and you're you know over. And and what is j that you're adding these, these over? That's the frequency. So you have these different frequencies. There's a whole series of frequencies, actually, uh, omega sub j's. Um, and, and those are the frequency components that all get added up. So you can see that each Fourier component is specific to a, a j index, which is really just the index to a frequency. Or, or another way of thinking about it is that's the position on the frequency axis. You know, That's a frequency. Okay, so you you multiply two complex numbers, and you know most often you you I'm sure you know you get a complex number. So f of t you know in general is going to be complex. Okay, uh, of course you know we have real signals. Seismograms do not have, you know, as we record seismograms, we do not record a complex component. We record all real uh, uh, seismograms. I mean, we can turn them complex, but that's that's in analysis. That's not as as reality. Okay, so we don't want there to be any imaginary part. Okay, so um, uh, how do we um, uh, how do we deal with this? How do we make sure that f of t is all real? That the, all of the imaginary parts are zero. All the imaginary, you know, the imaginary time series is zero. Okay, and we want the real time series to contain all the information. Now you know about the uh, the uh, uh, concept of the complex conjugate. So given some complex number f, which is equal to real a plus i, uh, and the imaginary part is b, okay, then the complex conjugate, which I might write uh, by saying f with a bar over it, or I might say f prime, different places I use different notation. Um, and uh, uh, so that the complex conjugate of f, which is f bar, is a minus. I B. So all you do is you negate the um, you negate the uh, the imaginary part. 
uh, and if you remember, you know what happens uh, with a uh, uh, with an Euler exponential. Uh, just to go all the way back here. Now, where is that? Um, with an Euler exponential, you 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 make the exponent negative, and all you're doing is you're getting the the complex conjugate. Here we go. Right. So this negative exponential is really just the complex conjugate of the positive exponent in the Euler exponential. Okay. It's not uh, you know it's not negating the cosine part at all. It's only negating the 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 uh, uh, the imaginary the imaginary part, uh, which is the sine part. Okay. So uh, uh, you can you know we can find the real part of um, we can find the real part of this possibly complex time series f. Okay. By just averaging the um, um, f plus its complex conjugate, okay. So that's the um, uh, that's a simple way of taking a possibly complex function and, and assuring that it's all real, okay. So uh, uh, that's uh, a simple way of getting the real part, okay. So we can apply that to the uh, Fourier uh, uh, series that we that we uh, put forward here. That is representing the uh, the data. So you know f of t is essentially going to be half the average of the sum, and and under the summation we have you know uh, uh, f uh, sub j the 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 uh, Fourier component at frequency index j uh, times the uh, e to the minus i omega sub j times t, and then we add the complex conjugate of f and and. Uh, of course, if you uh, take the complex conjugate of uh, of the whole thing, you have to take the complex conjugate of both uh, factors of it. So we take the complex conjugate of f sub j, and we also take the complex conjugate of e to the minus i omega sub j times t, which is just e to the positive i times omega sub j times t. So that's uh, um, uh, now we've we've uh, created an all real time series. Okay, so this. This series now, which which uh, you know, writing it as an ordered list here, you know, it's got all these uh, Fourier transform components, okay, and the series itself is called the Fourier transform. Uh, and here's some some things you can do, you know, once you have the Fourier transform and all of its components at all the different frequencies, okay, uh, you know, you can here's a definition actually of a spectrum, uh, and and I didn't. Use a, a, a three uh, a three tabled uh, uh, equal sign because this is not everybody's uh, definition of a spectrum. This is Clairvaux's definition of a spectrum, and as you can see, his definition of a spectrum is essentially the power spectrum. The amplitudes are squared here, right? So the Fourier component is um, um, uh, you know you essentially square it. You get the magnitude of the vector by taking the uh, um, <clears throat> by by taking the complex number times the complex number's um, complex conjugate, all right. So f times f bar gives you essentially the the uh, the square of the magnitude of the uh, of the uh, of the complex number, and that uh, um, that's a power, and that's what Clairaut calls a spectrum. Uh, of course, we're often going to be interested in the amplitude spectrum, which is the square root of that. At each component, at each frequency, so notice that that the spectrum is also a series, and each element of the series is is basically the square of the of the Fourier transform component at that frequency, and then the so is the amplitude spectrum. It's just the square root of each of those elements. So there's a separate uh, uh, you know there's a whole series here, as you see on the bottom row of um, of the. Uh, 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 on the bottom row of the uh, um, FFT lab tool, okay, there's a separate uh, Fourier component for each frequency, and uh, uh, and I uh, I said each frequency omega sub j because that's what I've been using up here. J is the frequency component. All right, so now you know everything we do. Um, I mean, we'll talk about some modifications, but we're going to sample omega evenly. And and by the way, uh, uh, 
um, when people started playing around with how to sample frequency unevenly and what frequency samples were redundant, that's when they came up with uh, the JPEG and MP3 and uh, uh, M4V you know, compression uh, concepts. So uh, uh, just a, an aside here, um, you know, we're going we're gonna to keep all the information and figure out how to do that while sampling at an even uh, frequency step, an even delta omega. Uh, but actually, some some very interesting and, and widely used work has been done by by figuring out how to sample unevenly in, in frequency. Um, essentially, uh, in most um, in most spectra, if you if you throw out the uh, in most Fourier transforms, if you throw out um, you know most of the high frequency uh, uh, Fourier transform components. You still have a perfectly adequate uh, representation of the time series, um, and that's uh, you know that's where MP3 is used to uh, to compress time series. Uh, you know, music is a time series, and and that's uh, you know that's where it can easily get its uh, ten to one compression, um, even when you um, and, and you might barely be able to hear. You know, have to be you have to be pretty. Pretty tuned to the to the music or the the sound to be able to hear the the what's been left out of the compression. Um, okay, so we're going to sample evenly. So this J now is the index. So the actual frequency, uh, you know, the continuous frequency, rotational frequency, is this this integer J times delta omega, just like we had the um, uh, the continuous uh, time. Was equal to I think it was I times delta t, right? So same concept here, uh, and and again that's it's just you know another uh, series of uh, uh, frequencies instead of times, um, and um, so the uh, the the signal now is um, you know we had uh, uh, the Fourier component f at frequency index j. Uh, times uh, e to the minus i, and we used to have um, omega sub j, but now we see that omega sub j is really just j times delta omega times t. Um, and I, we do a little bit less of it, but sometimes in some particularly gnarly um, algebraic uh, exercises in these notes and in, in Clairbaut's books, uh, you know, we'll actually assume uh, delta omega is one, okay, or or maybe uh, two pi. Okay, that'll be that 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 will occur. Okay, and you have to remember you got to go back all the way to this stage to actually to put in your actual delta omega uh, if we start to drop it. Okay, uh, it turns out that uh, all right here we have a method of taking uh, a uh, a uh, uh, of taking a, a Fourier transform series and and getting back the time series. So when you make some changes in FFT lab on the bottom row, and then it, it, it automatically uh, immediately updates the top row, it's basically doing this this Fourier sum. Okay, so so another way to think of that is that uh, we have a Fourier transform, and the Fourier transform operator or process is going to is going to go you know usually. It's, we're going to start with time series data. And we're going to result in frequency series uh, Fourier transform components. Okay, and this goes the other way. So we call this, you know, this Fourier series summation is the inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so then uh, uh, the logical question is, well, you know, why have I defined the the inverse before the forward? Well, given some some f of t, how do we find the Fourier transform components? All right, so here's a here's a little uh, you know what I hope is a uh, a reminder, um, you know what is the uh, the Fourier transform, the forward Fourier Fourier transform. I'm going to give the definition here. I'm not going to derive it. I mean that's that's for a Fourier transform class. Um, we're going to talk about some Fourier transform theories, and I want you to be aware of of how to work with the Fourier transform, and uh, certainly in this continuous. Uh, Definition, right? Here's a here's a definition in terms of continuous functions, okay? Um, and the um, 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 uh, 
then there's going to be the question of how do we generate a Fourier transform of a discrete time series, a sample time series. And actually, we're going to talk a lot about a lot about that. Okay, so um, you know, if you're unsure about how to do a Fourier transform uh, in the computer, uh, we're actually going to talk talk quite a lot about that. Um, and that's going to be key to our understanding of sample time series. Is exactly what the Fourier transform uh, for the, the the discrete Fourier transform, the DFT, can do for us versus the FT, which is just the continuous Fourier transform. So hopefully you've seen this before, and this is just a definition. Um, all right. So uh, uh, you know, in in uh, discrete form, we had those discrete components F sub J. Now we have Fourier com we have a Fourier density really. Uh, uh, it's they're not individual components, but it's a function. Uh, it's a continuous function uh, of of frequency omega, rotational frequency omega, and it's this uh, integral from minus infinity to plus infinity in time. Right, we're integrating over time, and and that's done. You know, under this integration, the frequency omega is a constant. Right, you do this whole integration from over infinite time. And you get just one uh, component. You know, you just get you get one. You get the Fourier transform at one omega. You know, which is just one complex number. Okay, so you, out of this whole integration, right, which is multiplying the the time series times this uh, these Fourier uh, this Fourier exponential, um, which I'll start to call it, which you can see is just an Euler exponential e to the i omega t. Right, so it's cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. Um, that's uh, um, uh, that whole integration leads to one complex number, and that's f of at, at this constant omega. You want to get it at a different omega? Okay, you gotta you gotta do the integration at a different constant omega. Okay, um, so again, you can start to see that that this is going to take if you have if you have n uh, samples in your um, in your time series, it's going to take n squared. You know, every time, every time the uh, uh, the way to think about it is that in FFT lab, okay, maybe you have sixty four samples in your time series, and every time you you update that and it updates the bottom, which is the Fourier series, then it's it's doing sixty four times sixty four um, of these multiplications under the integrals. Okay, n squared uh, is the computational effort required there. So far as we know yet, uh, here's another notation up here. Um, you know the Fourier transform of of little f, the time series little f, we call big F. Uh, I often use capital letters to denote a transformed object. Um, but as we'll see, you know you got to look in at the at the parameters or the arguments to the uh, to the object to see exactly what I've done. And so you take a time series f of t. And you apply the Fourier transform operator, which is this cursive f, and you get the uh, Fourier transform series in in or the Fourier transform function in omega. Um, and then here's uh, an expression of the inverse. And the important thing here, well, there's several important things that Clairbout maybe does differently from how you've seen the Fourier transform before. Notice that there's no in the forward Fourier transform on this top row here in the box. There's no scale factor, okay, uh, and uh, you may have seen in 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 uh, the the whole scale factor is taken when you inverse transform, okay. And I actually like in the software I've written, I don't do it that way. I want to keep, you know, I want to keep the uh, uh, scale factor out of there. So I apply, you know, essentially I apply a one over the square root of two pi uh, when I when I do the forward transforms. But in all the for for simplicity, algebraic simplicity in the book and the notes, you know almost everything that Clairbaut does here, he doesn't apply the scale factor in the forward, only in the inverse. Okay, so the whole scale factor is applied in the inverse. Okay, just a way of simplifying the math, and it's not it's not really practical, right? Because your 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 trans you know you 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 calculate your your transform your transform amplitudes are going to depend on how long the time series was. Okay, and, and you need that scale factor to uh, to to get rid of that. Um, and so when I actually compute the transforms, I always apply the scale factor. You know, uh, I, I apply the square the square root of the scale factor 
you know, in the forward, and I apply the square root of the scale factor in the inverse, just to keep things even. You know, so the amplitudes are understandable. Um, but that's that's one uh, uh, one idiosyncrasy of these notes. Um, uh, and there is also a deeper um, uh, uh, reason for this definition and why it may be slightly unfamiliar. Um, as geophysicists, we love to play with explosions and, and waves that are propagating out, that are expanding. You know, we love to play with expanding waves. And um, uh, in um, uh, because because we use uh, you know expanding waves in all of our surveys. You know, we generate waves. On the other hand, an awful lot of Fourier transform theory, Fourier transform software has been developed by electrical engineers. What problems do electrical engineers love to contemplate? They they like to deal with with radio waves collapsing onto antennas. Okay, so it turns out that electrical engineers who've written most of the software and come up with most of the theory want to use a different sign convention on the time transform than the geophysicists do. So of course, in Clairbaut's book, he he he's a geophysicist. He adopts a geophysicist. Uh, um, uh, sign convention, which is that the uh, Euler exponential is positive in the forward transform in time, and then you reverse it, you take it negative, take the complex conjugate in the inverse transform in time. Okay, This leads to the most natural Fourier transform for um, uh, geophysicists, but when you look at a piece of Fourier transform software, more than likely the, Fourier, the forward Fourier transform in time will have the engineer's um, uh, convenient uh, uh, negative sign on the forward and positive on the inverse. All right. So this is how we're going to do it. But be warned that uh, you may see uh, a different uh, something different later on, uh, or when you go outside, you know, these lecture notes and and, and this book. Um, okay. Now, uh, uh, just to um, uh, just to remind you uh, again, I'm not I'm not deriving it. Um, you know, does this does this transform work on everything? I mean, we certainly use it on everything. You know, we use the Fourier transform. We're going to use it on everything. You know, because because you know most of what we're analyzing are wave fields, which are from second order partial differential equations, uh, and um, and that's one good reason, uh, and it's just it leads to so many simplifications and, and conveniences that we want to use the Fourier transform on everything. Okay, so when when can we use this Fourier transform? When is it valid? Okay, when is it when is the Fourier series, the Fourier transform F capital F, when is that an adequate representation of little f? All right, and we talked a little bit about the about. Uh, well, we don't have to talk about sampling here. This is just continuous. All right. Here is a sufficient. It's not a necessary condition for validity, but it is a sufficient con uh, condition for validity of the Fourier transform that the the integral of the magnitude over the magnitude of the time series is less than infinite. Okay. And this integral goes from you know negative infinity to positive infinity in time. So so maybe maybe one way of saying this is that it's a transient series. You know, you get out to infinite time, and the galaxies have all collapsed, and the uh, the suns, the stars have all died away, and there's no amplitude. Okay, so you you got to you know that's that's a sufficient condition for uh, um, for validity. Um, here's a function that does not meet that that condition. Uh, it's a continuous function known as the heavy side step function. Okay. And the heavy side step function is zero uh, at all negative times, and then at zero time and forward, it is uh, it is one. Okay, and you can see that that is not a transient function. You know that at, out at, at infinite time, you know after the death of the universe, it's still one. Okay, so um, so so here's a very commonly used function that we actually cannot Fourier transform. Okay, theoretically it doesn't work. Um, 
so uh, uh, we have to be aware that when we are using uh, discrete, you know, sampled heavy side step functions on finite time series, right? Because I don't know what's the longest seismogram you've ever seen. You know, maybe a year's worth would be would be pretty extreme. A month's worth is getting more common. No, you know, I day, day long. Day long. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So so uh, you know, um, we don't have any. Any infinitely long series that we're that we're dealing with, but see here we're still talking about continuous functions, and they do go to infinity. And uh, the continuous version of the heavy side step function cannot be Fourier transformed. Okay, and uh, so we, uh, just a warning there. Now I'm going to start talking about um, Fourier transforms um, in terms of uh, of the theorems that accompany. Uh, the Fourier transform that I that I just defined for you. Uh, so the idea is we have the uh, the you know some function f in the time domain. Okay, so this is uh, you know by writing it this way, I'm saying that's the continuous time domain, and we apply the Fourier transform operator, which is exactly uh, this uh, uh, this integral here uh, at all frequencies. Okay, and um, or we leave, you know, we leave omega as a uh, as a variable to do that for all frequencies, any possible frequency. Uh, the inverse uh, I would call f to the minus one. Um, you know, that would be f inverse. Okay, and that results in that Fourier transform operate, operation results in capital F, uh, which is a continuous function in rotational frequency omega. Okay. So, so uh, rather than write it this way, I'm going to write it in this very simple way using this double-headed arrow. Okay, and you may catch me. Uh, there are places, certainly in my notes, maybe even in Clairbout's book, where instead of using a double-headed arrow, uh, we've used a, an equal sign, and that's uh, uh, you know that's an error. Okay, but I, I I actually think of it. You know, I I make substitutions. In equations, as if this Fourier dual meant equals. Okay, and I'll, I'll, tell, I'll talk to you about the the implications of that. I mean, that's a very useful thing to do. Okay, but formally, you know, this is this is my notation for a Fourier dual. Okay, it is not an equal sign, but it means that uh, big F of omega is the Fourier transform of little f of t. Okay. So let's look at some of the, the Fourier theories. And, and really, we're, these are just going to be properties of the Fourier transform that we're going to make use of. Okay? Uh, there's a linearity property. All right? So if you are combining signals, right? We're, we, take, we have different signals, different size grounds, F1 and F2, both in time. And we can scale them. We can scale F2 by A2. We can scale. Uh, uh, F1 by A1, you know those are those are uh, complex or or uh, or real uh, scalars. Okay, um, we can add series together, you know, and if we can add two series, then we can add you know a large number of of, of uh, functions. These are not. I'm sorry. These are not functions. These are not discrete series. These are continuous functions here. Okay, F1 and F2. All right, that that linear combination. Has a Fourier dual with look at this exactly the same linear combination of the uh, uh, of, of the Fourier transforms of F one and the Fourier transform of F two. Okay, so you know you get exactly the same thing if you add all this together and you take its Fourier transform. It's exactly the same as as adding it together with the same. You know, notice that the same Scalars are in here, and it should be clear why that's true, right? A uh, a constant is just going to come right through this uh, this integral sign. Just take the constant right out. So that's that's why it works. The summation, you know, uh, is just uh, uh, distributing the integral sign in to the uh, into the summation. So that that uh, uh, the linearity property is um, uh, maybe it's kind of obvious. But it's worth stating here because it's going to make so many things so 
easy and so useful for us. Okay, we want to. Uh, what this is going to mean is that if we want to break apart our data, we can break it apart in in time. We can break it apart in frequency. We can break it apart in amplitude. We can we all you know the Fourier transform preserves all this linearity, and so we can we can subdivide and chop up our data in any way we want. And it, and it will all add back together, okay? So uh, that's that's an incredible simplification. Um, let's see. Here's some other examples uh, that we don't use quite as often. Um, time shifting. You know, let's say we delay a um, a uh, 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 a time series f. We have f of t, and we delay it by some delay t sub zero, t zero, or t naught. Okay, so we so it's really f of t minus t zero. All right, the Fourier dual of that delayed time series is the Fourier transform of of the original f. Okay, and multiplied by e to the minus i omega times t zero. Okay, so this is called the uh, shift theorem in Fourier theory. Okay, uh, and I had th this little red dot. That's actually a, a zero right there. That's a, an omega zero there. That's a mistake I made. Same omega zero. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, you know, just uh, and but you know, notice that this uh, uh, this Fourier dual it really cuts both ways. You know, it's expressed as a time shift on top, and it's expressed as a frequency shift on the bottom. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, you're going to use one of these in. Um, uh, in I think in lab six, okay, you'll need to use one of these. Um, that's a that's a hint, because um, you'll want to make a frequency shift, and uh, uh, and it's easily done this way, okay, uh, at, by taking the uh, f of t and multiplying by uh, um, by e to the minus e to the i omega zero t. Uh, this is actually uh, also um, the, the principle behind AM radio. Um, okay, uh, scaling. All right, uh, and and this is really you know time stretching and time shrinking. It's not it's not uh, it's not linear scaling, right? With these scalars here, it's 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 a axis stretch. So uh, you know if we stretch out the axis by alpha, then here's the you know we can derive. The same, you know, the Fourier transform uh, of the stretched um, uh, the stretched time series we can derive by this uh, essentially shrunk um, uh, frequency series or frequency function, and there's a little bit of scaling there too, and 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 it's another one that cuts both ways. Okay, uh, we can. Do a stretch in on the frequency axis on the omega axis, and it ends up being a uh, shrink on the time axis. Okay. Again, this this you know you could prove any of these to yourself to to yourselves uh, just by using those um, the the definition integral. Uh, there's also this very very important symmetry property, and um, uh, you'll need to use that in in lab one. I'm pretty sure. Um, Okay, now now uh, uh, I don't know if you've heard of even and odd functions. Okay, here is a uh, uh, this little green squiggle is uh, is an example of an even function. Okay, um, and think of it as a as a cosine. Okay, so the cosine um, the cosine of omega. If we, well, the cosine of t. If we plotted it, uh, you know, here's a time axis increasing to the right. Here's a, a you know the amplitude axis increasing up, um, and there's the origin right, and so uh, the cosine might look like this because at uh, at zero time the cosine of t is equal to one, okay, uh, and uh, as you go to negative time or to positive time right we're just falling off this uh, mound that's centered at uh, at the uh, at zero time, okay. Uh, the sine is an what's called an odd function, uh, not 
not because it's strange in any way. It's just that it's uh, uh, it's just that, that it's um, it's uh, anti it's uh, oh, what's it called anti uh, symmetric or or even uh, as you could call it conjugate symmetric. All right. So so you know if you if you look you know if we look at this time here. Well, let's see. If we look at this time here, right, and and we look at the equal amount of negative time, we have the same. We have exactly the same amplitude, right? So f at minus t is equal to f at t, okay, for an even function. For an odd function, f at minus t is equal to minus f at t, right? So here, you know, we look at f f at t, it's positive. We look at f at minus t, it's negative. That's an odd function, okay. And, and as I've said, you know, the uh, uh, our Fourier transform having this um, this Euler exponential here, you know, we're multiplying by cosines to 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 see how even a function is, and we're also multiplying by sines to see how odd a function is. So what the what the symmetry is telling you here is that you have uh, a um, an even function, okay, and uh, the real in, in the time domain you have an even function. The real part of it uh, uses the cosine part of the transform, and it, it be, and, and thus remains an even function in the frequency domain. Okay, you have an even function on the imaginary part that still activates only the cosine part of the transform. And it remains an even function in the uh, in the frequency domain. It's still it's still it's still even. It's still imaginary. Okay. In the you know these are Fourier duals here in the in the uh, uh, in in the in the omega domain. Okay. However, you have an odd function that activates the sine part of the transform, which is now on the the imaginary part, right? And so it turns the the real odd function into an imaginary odd function. Okay. Now, now you can. Uh, I, I suggest that you exercise this this symmetry in um, uh, right in FFT lab. You know, as you're playing with it, draw some even functions. Uh, draw them on. You know, zero everything out. Draw an even function on the real part, and 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 you should see it appear. Only on the you should see it appear as an even function on the uh, on the real part, and and if you if you start with a, with a zero imaginary part, then there will be nothing on the imaginary part. Okay, if you draw an odd function, then and and you first so first you zero everything out, you draw an odd function, okay, on the real part, then you're going to see nothing. On the uh, on the real part, it's all going to be on the imaginary part in the on the frequency axes. Okay, so so uh, you know it's going to switch from real to imaginary. Uh, and likewise, if if you draw um, an odd function on the uh, imaginary part, it's going to activate again the sine part on the imaginary part of the transform, and it's going to appear then on the real part as an odd function. Okay, so real even becomes real even in the frequency domain, uh, and and vice versa. Uh, imaginary even becomes imaginary even in the frequency domain. Uh, real odd becomes imaginary odd, and imaginary odd becomes real odd. Okay, and try not to get distracted by what what a really odd function could be. Um, okay, so. Uh, what it, what is you know one way to summarize what this table is saying is that a real f okay let's say we have no imaginary parts here right because our data in the time domain is all is all real okay so i e is nothing i o is nothing and then of course like any any function any seismogram we're going to have you know we're going to have an odd part we're going to have an even part you know we don't know exactly the mixture yet okay so what are we going to get out. We're going to get out a conjugate symmetric function. Okay, so we start with a real function, and we get out, you know, what was real even 
becomes real even. Okay? What was real odd becomes imaginary odd. It becomes conjugate. Okay? It's a conjugate symmetry. It's crossing between real and, and imaginary parts. Okay? So we only have real, real, plus, real even plus real odd becomes real even plus, on the imaginary part, i, i uh, imaginary odd. And uh, uh, I don't know. It's probably nothing that I find more um, more annoying than than getting odd functions on the imaginary part. For some reason, that just bothers me. Um, okay. Uh, and then here's a little demonstration of of you know going through the definition how that how that works. Okay. Uh, which you can which you can repeat if you want. Um, all right. So let me. Real quick, try to start the uh, the next section of the notes. Actually, uh, number three, um, and um, let's see, and we'll go another fifteen minutes, maybe. Okay, because I had, I had simply just simply reached the end of my um, um, of my ability to have the the copy machine um, um, digitize the the pages. It wasn't any 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 you know real break in in concepts. So um, all right, so that's that's the symmetry property. Here's another property. Okay. Convolution has a Fourier dual with multiplication. Okay, so so you know this convolution, the convolution of f one with f two, whatever they are, you know that's an integral. That's that's uh, that's kind of difficult to do. Okay, well at least it's going to take n squared, uh, you know, on the order of n squared operations to do. But look at this, the um, uh, in you, you transform both f1 and f2 into the Fourier domain, and all you do is multiply them frequency by frequency. Okay, multiply two complex numbers. That doesn't take that much effort, and um, uh, and and notice that these are at the same frequency. There's no integral here. This is just a, a, a multiplication of two complex numbers. Okay. So how many operations is that for the whole thing? To do the whole convolution, but in the frequency domain, okay, you only have n multiplications. I don't know. You know, given uh, how you multiply complex numbers, it's probably something like uh, three or four n multiplications. But but the idea is it's not n squared, right? When you have a day long time series, you know, which might have what ten million samples, I mean, n squared starts to be a little bit tough. You know we can do it now, but but it's it's a little tough. You know we got to allocate some resources. Um, and and back you know back when I was learning this stuff, that was totally impossible. You know just you know you couldn't do a convolution that was that was uh, uh, that would take uh, ten to the twelfth multiplications because um, you know that was I didn't want to delay my thesis that long. You know <laughs> totally impractical. Um, okay, now now look at this. Multiplication. It's another one that cuts both ways. Multiplication in the time domain, right? We just multiply, you know, the, the real time series f one times f two at 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 each time, right? At each time, and I should have put the time axis in there. Okay, that's equal to the convolution integral being applied over frequency instead of time. But but you know you can write the same integral uh, just in the frequency domain. Okay, so if you if you want to do a convolution in the frequency domain, uh, you know that's going to take uh, maybe uh, maybe w is the number of frequencies you have, uh, and so this convolution will take w squared, but it only take uh, it only take n operations n multiplications here, but I should have put I should have put time, you know time in parentheses with in front uh, after f one and f two to make that clear. Uh, okay, here's the proof of that, um, and uh, you can you can see it's just going through the uh, um, 
the uh, the integral, and um, there's really only one trick, and that's that's making this um, uh, you know here's the convolution integral, um, and that's a, a, a substitution of, of variables, right? Uh, t prime instead of uh, t minus tau. Uh, in this, uh, you know, we got an integration in t here. We got an integration in tau, and um, you know, we do this. Uh, 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 one convenient thing here is that the, uh, uh, you know, with the chain rule, the uh, um, uh, the uh, the derivative uh, of of the substitution is is just one or minus one, so that's pretty simple, um, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, that's that's really the only trick that's that's involved here, and so so you know what you. What you end up with is being able to break apart, you know, in the algebra, you, you could break apart um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, you can recognize this, you can kind of reorder this and recognize this as a um, uh, as a Fourier transform, okay, of f one alone, and this is a separate Fourier transform of f two alone. All right. And and the fact that that it's in t prime really doesn't make any difference. Okay, it's still a recognizable Fourier transform uh, integral. So uh, this this kind of trick, okay, that's you know this is Clairbaut's bread and butter. Uh, this is the kind of thing, the kind of of thing you know, sorting out the integrals, putting things together, sorting out the integrals. And 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 then trying to rec you know going through and trying to recognize simpler things that we already understand you know so we we uh, uh, we put this convolution together and by a change of, of variables we can break it apart into two Fourier transforms that we can recognize that are multiplied together okay and that's what proves that Fourier theorem and, and uh, it's it's it, this is this is exactly the kind of algebra. That uh, uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the homework uh, requires, um, and and a lot of the, uh, uh, the it's led to amazing things like the first practical method of 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 doing a, a seismic migration. Okay, it was based on 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 almost as simple an algebraic trick, and and recognizing things that we already know. Uh, you know, and manipulating these these things to uh, to find those those simple things, right? Because here's you know this is just the uh, Fourier transform of of f1, and this is just the Fourier transform of f2. And so this kind of substitution, this kind of recognition, and resubstitution, that's that's behind all of it. Okay, um, so that's you know this kind of thing is is going to be a fair amount of the work. You know, maybe a third of the work you have in your in your uh, homework assignments. Um, you know, another third is going to be uh, uh, you know after doing some algebra, finding finding uh, uh, a program modification that will implement that. Okay, so so uh, um, uh, these are these are you know very important processes uh, uh, for this class. Okay, uh, Parseval's theorem. All right. Basically, saying that uh, uh, we're conserving energy when we do a Fourier transform. Okay, you sum up all the uh, integrate over all the Fourier transform components, and and here you got to include the scale factor. Okay, um, and uh, uh, and you uh, sum up the energy in the in the time series. You get the same number, same amount of energy. Okay, uh, very important. Uh, this is going to assure us that. We can represent physical processes through the Fourier transform. It's not, you know, it's not blowing up our solution. It's not, uh, it's not sapping the energy out of our waves. You know, it's it's just passing everything through. Okay, conserves energy. It's very important for us. Okay, um, you know, not having to worry about that through the Fourier transform is key. Um, let's see. So. Um, this is just writing down what the 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 square or the magnitude of the Fourier of the Fourier component is, right? Uh, it's just multiplying uh, f by its uh, complex conjugate, uh, and then um, we put in the definitions of the uh, 
uh, of the Fourier transform of the four, you know, what is f? Okay, there it is in terms of of, uh, of little f, uh, but we're going to keep them separated by by integrating that over this uh, uh, dt double prime. Um, the first one is the conjugate. Okay, so there's its uh, Fourier transform integral over dt prime, uh, and the conjugate just comes in there with a negative sign on the Fourier exponen ex exponential, um, and um, so we got two dummy variables, and we just do a rearrangement. You know, what can we put under which which one? And so here we recognize the Fourier transform of a particular special function. You may or may not have heard of this before. This is the uh, the Dirac delta function. Okay, and um, so the Fourier and and you cannot well. Notice that that the expression for the Dirac delta function is an integral. Okay, basically an integral over the Fourier uh, exponential, without any function in there. So so the, the Dirac delta function is kind of a representation of of the Fourier transform itself. Okay, um, and. Uh, uh, but but you know if if you ask me uh, well what is the value of the Dirac delta function at uh, time zero I mean I can't tell you it's under, it's actually undefined okay but but you can represent it with this integral no problem um, it's a lot easier to deal with delta functions in the in the discrete time or frequency domain because they're just spikes like you see you know like you see those spikes in in FFT lab it's just a uh, one value with zeros everywhere else at all other times. So that's easy, but this continuous Dirac delta function is bizarre. Uh, you can only write it down as an integral. Um, so uh, uh, you know, part of this is, is, is recognizing this, uh, this integral. And um, if you Fourier transform a Dirac delta function, okay, then you're integrating over this, and that's the integral is going to come out to be 1. Okay, so the power in a Dirac delta function is one. The amplitude goes infinite, goes undefined because because it's only you know the only amplitude of the Dirac delta the Dirac delta function only has a non-zero amplitude at zero time. Okay, but it still has an integral of one, and so you like you have this infinitely thin uh, line, and uh, uh, so it's you know that's that's how bizarre it is. It's a, it's a singularity. So the integral is is transient. The you know it's got transient energy. It, it's it's uh, it's got limited energy. Um, you know it's like the perfect transient. It's it's infinitely thin in in terms of, of its time span, uh, it, its time width, uh, but it's um, um, uh, and, it, and it has infinite amplitude at zero um, at zero time uh, and zero amplitude everywhere else. So uh, Bizarre, hard to express uh, in continuous form, and you can do it only through this integral. So uh, uh, you know that becomes one. Okay, we recognize that function. Okay, and I'm talking about it here just in case you you haven't seen it before. Uh, and you you so then you put the the delta function in there, and notice it's a delta function of t prime minus t double prime, and you know every, wherever t prime is not equal to t double prime, then the Dirac delta function is 0. So that just reduces this integration uh, to this. And, um, uh, uh, and, and so uh, uh, that's, how we, uh, uh, that's how we can get, uh, uh, get to the uh, Parsifal's theorem. Okay. Um, so these are these are all the necessary facts on the continuous Fourier transform, um, and we're going to take advantage of all of those uh, as we go into the discrete uh, transform. Um, and uh, uh, there's a there's a lot more we need to learn that you won't get in a Fourier transform or or uh, or, or uh, class, math class on uh, you know differential equations. And that's what really that's really what this first part of the class is all about. Let's understand how we're actually using the Fourier transform 
how we're using it as a discrete transform. 